with the servicing needs and their lenders that service their portfolio. And then thirdly, we've got um, a, a working department within a national lender, J.P. Morgan Chase, and they're going to talk to us about how they are, at their corporate institutional level, addressing some of the issues with regard to maintaining home ownership with their servicing base. So um, if, uh, because we're sort of limited on time, and we've been asked to actually break up at 2.10, so you're gonna get a little extra break so that they can reassemble this big old room that we were all in this morning. And so in order to facilitate that time constraint and boundary, could we go ahead and, as the speakers are talking, take some notes on some key questions. Most of your tables have cards on them. So just jot a note to yourself if something strikes a, a question in your mind. And then at the end of each speaker, there's going to be a few minutes to address those questions. And then after uh, each speaker and that, that mini Q&A, we'll wrap it up with kind of a, a panel Q&A, depending on the amount of time we have left. So, um, any questions so far? This is a tough gig here. It's right after lunch. I couldn't eat that entire chocolatey thing in front of me, but it sure had some sugar. And I get to stand up and move. You don't. So uh, we'll try to keep this exciting and uh, germane to what your needs are. Um, real quick, for the benefit of the panel, raise your hand, please, if you are in some capacity a lender, whether it's servicer, originator, etc. Thank you. How about if you're a counselor? Okay, that's about the same split as we had in the overall population of the room this morning. So we've got a good combination of folks in here. I'm glad all the lenders aren't seated together. Um, and I'm glad we've got a dispersion of folks. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. John Groney from uh, Chicago Neighborhood Housing Services. And John is uh, responsible for um, strategies, neighborhood strategies and policy. Did I get that right, John? And uh, he's uh, been involved, uh, I'm pretty sure from day one, with the Chicago Initiative. So he's got, he's got that institutional memory, so to speak, of the program that we've heard the results of this morning. So John, why don't you go ahead and kick us off, please. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, oh yeah, I'll stand up just to make sure we can hear. Um, I want to go through really quickly kind of the evolution of our program that has since arrived to what it is today in terms of Hopi, as we call it, or the Federal Reserve Chairman always says Hopi, which kind of annoys us, but Hopi, the Homeownership Preservation Initiative. And then some kind of key points of uh, things that we had to put in place to get, to get where we are. Um, First of all, looking back in the late 1990s, I was working in the backyards neighborhood near South Side of Chicago uh, as the neighborhood director and really working at strengthening the neighborhood neighborhood revitalization. And we started seeing more and more vacant buildings. And the construction specialist in my office started to help us in terms of trying to, we were looking at more as these vacant buildings were magnets for crime and we wanted to acquire them, you know, rehab them and sell them to homeowner occupants. So he started getting the local newspaper, the Backyards Journal, and highlighting in yellow the properties in the neighborhood and, you know, leaving that on my desk. And so, of course, I didn't do anything with it right away and it, it built up over two, three months. And eventually I took the whole pile and I said, oh, God, this, is a, this is a lot of properties. So I created a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. We just started tracking the properties. And at the end of the year, we were over 150 properties. And this is a neighborhood that's 10 by 12 blocks long. So one of the things for this panel, they asked about you know, the research that you use. It could be very simple in terms of getting the attention of your board members, attention of your funders, in terms of look at the number of foreclosures that are, are being generated in our area. So when they talk about 1% foreclosure rates in the country or 2%, you know, in our neighborhoods, in the eight NHS neighborhoods, we are seeing foreclosure rates seven times the national average, 10 times the national average in, in a couple of neighborhoods. So we click, we quickly started, you know, realizing that, wait a minute, this is a big problem. And then 
we really started working on predatory lending as an issue. And these were really fun times. This was black and white, good versus evil stuff. We set up a rescue fund to refinance people that had received legal settlements after getting a predatory loan. And it was a lot of fun stuff. I remember one story was, um, we actually knocked on the door of a homeowner who didn't respond to one of our letters because it was the day of his foreclosure sale. I'm like, you know, what are you gonna do? This is a retired steel worker, you had a pension, you had social security. It's like you're losing your home. What, you know, what happened? It's like, well, I tried to do chapter 13s, they didn't work, I really don't know what to do. Well, in Illinois, after the foreclosure sale, there's a confirmation sale two weeks later. I said, bring in your paperwork. Bring it into the office tomorrow, let's look at it. And the loan he had gotten right there in black and white, second page, the HUD one, 10% loan origination fee. That's a HOPA violation. The Legal Assistance Foundation said, yep, we'll take that case. They took the case within three months it was settled for you know 30,000 more than what he owed. He could afford this. We did a refi rehab loan. So very satisfying. The problem with that was that we're doing about 50 a year. So we're finding 50 predatory loans a year, referring to legal assistance, using the rescue fund. Um, very successful program. But at the same time, by 2002, there were 9,431 foreclosures initiated in the city of Chicago. So we realized that we weren't doing enough to affect this change. So at which point, we started the Hopi Partnership, which, even for NHS staff for, for a while, I mean, following the lead of our executive director, like, wait, what are we doing? We're partnering with all the lenders that are lending in our neighborhoods. These just weren't the three or four local banks. These are banks from across the, the country, both prime and subprime, and saying, wait a minute, we need to look at uh, partnering with all these organizations to solve as many of these foreclosure cases as possible. Um, in the eight neighborhood, in the eight targeted NHS neighborhoods, for, for years and years, all NHS did was create new homeowners, create new homeownership opportunities, and help people fix up their homes. And we quickly realized that we had to do foreclosure prevention counseling. In the neighborhoods alone, on a yearly basis, we'll create just over 200 new homeowners, but we're now also saving about that same number of people from foreclosure. In other words, if we weren't doing this, we wouldn't be progressing in the neighborhood. Um, so where do we start? I think the number one thing that we had to do, five minutes, is define a foreclosure save. What is a foreclosure save? And then retrain all the counselors and redo their job descriptions so they did both pre-purchase counseling and delinquency counseling. So they would have goals of, um, you know, 48 foreclosure or 48 positive outcomes being either people being pre-approved by the first home or foreclosure saves and really looking at, at those outcomes and tracking those outcomes and the reasons for the delinquencies and the, who the servicer was and how much principal was outstanding on those loans. Um, so I think that was a key one. One of the first things we changed is we used to consider a chapter 13 as a successful outcome we quickly saw that those were absolutely not very successful, less than a 20% success rate. So we knocked that out of our definition of foreclosure save. So really looking at repayment plans, forbearance agreements, loan modifications, you all know the drill, in terms of this is a foreclosure save. The last one we added and we still do is a confirmed sale of the property. Um, so that was absolutely the number one thing that we had to do. Um, the second thing that we kind of learned is that when, when borrowers are delinquent, especially once in, in Illinois, once it's public record and you know from uh, first mispayment to the foreclosure sales, 13 months, but once it's public record, everybody and his brother is marketing to these homeowners from the people that want to buy their house, people that want to buy their house and lease it back to them, to, uh, bankruptcy lawyers, to who know, you know, there was title theft, there's all kinds of things going on. We would actually track how much marketing that the homeowners would get, and it would be a you know, pile this big. And so quickly we realized that it really is a race to get to the homeowners before the bad guys did. Um, the other thing we learned 
We used to when a someone would come in and say, you know, I'm behind in March, I lost my job, we'd say, well, we really can't do anything for you now, but once you're working, come back and we'll talk to you. Now when they say that, we say, okay, hold on. Okay, we're gonna go through the foreclosure timeline, how long you have, and we're gonna warn you about all the people that are going to be contacting you. And if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Um, Third, I think we started seeing that the role of the NHS counselor is kind of this trusted third party um, advisor that could work with the homeowner and the servicer. I think a lot of times our clients would get the financials from a bank and everybody, every bank's financials are different. And you know, you know it's four or five pages, fill this out, give it back. Our counselors would help the homeowner fill those out and then assist them with communicating with the servicer. And that started working, and um, Donald's gonna talk a little bit later, but as cross-training between services and NHS staff started, we became even more effective. Um, fourth, we put warnings about predatory lending, warnings about rescue fraud, warnings about how to protect yourself in a homeowner into all of our education classes. So our eight-hour pre-purchase, our eight-hour post-purchase, everything we're doing, and we were, you know, we were getting up on the chairs and saying, okay, um, beware of these. Uh, in the very early stages, we, we came up with the, the motto, um, either, if you're gonna borrow money against your house, either go, go into the bank branch in your neighborhood or come to NHS. Because, you know, say things like, you know, I'm sure there's good brokers out there, but we've never seen their work come through our office. That, that whole kind of a, a message to people because it really was getting that bad in the neighborhood. Um, we're looking at, in terms of reasonable goals and setting expectations for people coming through the door, very much, we thought when we got into this business, everybody came through our door, we could save 50%. What we're seeing is save rates between 20 and 25%. Um, in terms of the specific outcomes that we would call a foreclosure save. Um, I think, lastly, I think working with the, we're starting to have more success with the individual servicers, not only um, just working with them in general, but having second tier staff that if our counselor runs into a roadblock working with their frontline staff, that we could kind of get beyond that. Um, we actually do monthly meetings with all of our counselors to talk about success stories, <coughs> talk about roadblocks. We actually elect a loss mitigation professional of the month if one of the, the people on the other end of the phone really went out of their way to help. Um, so, key points. One, the foreclosure prevention is indispensable for our mission in, in the eight neighborhoods we work in in Chicago in terms of neighborhood revitalization. Uh, I think two, that each organization that's doing this has to define what a foreclosure save is. So that, and then retrain and redo the job descriptions of counselors so they can do both pre-purchase and post-purchase. Um, the importance of partnering, um, we've gotten a lot more people into our doors because of the partnership with the City of Chicago and the 311 non-emergency line, uh, the postcards and the marketing surrounding that. Um, we've started doing, with selected servicers, we're actually doing, they do mail-ins to their um, loan clients in our neighborhoods and selected zip codes that are already behind and invite them to an NHS, we call our post-purchase outreach seminars. Um, and that's getting more people on our door that have never heard of NHS and never heard of uh, counseling agencies. Um, and then, of course, the, the development of, if you're looking at, they were asking about what were the most common loss mitigation solutions, I'd say, Probably 85% of the foreclosure saves that we're producing um, are through uh, agreements with the lenders. Only about 15% are done using our rescue fund, which is a, a refinance with rehab, or a bridge loan, which is a loan we've caught up. And then lastly, I think the other future that we're, that we're working on in terms of the next bridge to cross is 40% of the people working with have lost their jobs. So we're now working with job search agencies, uh, local uh, job search job training agencies to get them to prioritize 
the clients that we are working with, you know, making clear that this isn't just a job loss, this could be a job loss and a loss of a home in the community. And, you know, we're seeing time and time again, foreclosures, when they go to REO, nine times out of 10, that homeowner occupied house becomes an investor owned house. And it really, it's, um, it's a real barrier in terms of, of, of the neighborhood moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very difficult thing to jam. Huh? Cool. Does it even work? Thanks. This is a difficult thing to jam. It could be a half a day or a day seminar into 10 minutes. So I think John did a really good job of summarizing at a high level. Does anybody, we've got enough time for a couple of quick questions pertaining to John's presentation in Chicago. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Through CDBG dollars, through the city of Chicago Department of Housing, we get paid $35 per hour for foreclosure prevention counseling and pre-purchase counseling. And we are, you know, we believe that we continue to receive that funding because we're, sh so um, that offsets part of it. And then I think all the other funding is, is through the servicers working with us on the Hopi project that are involved because, you know, it's, we're learning all that, you know, ways to increase more, increase the foreclosure save rates, you know, and I think they're involved um, at this point. So, so far we've been successful in raising money around that interest and in, because of the success, whether that'll continue in three years when it's not as hot a topic. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, in, in Chicago, you know, everybody's heard of 411. In Chicago, the city of Chicago's muni municipal number that people called, so it was already set up, people called for non emergencies, and it was originally a way to take call volume out of 911 for non emergency things. So it's their non emergency number, and so working with the city of Chicago Department of Housing, and the mayor was very interested from, a, you know, he was investing a lot in the neighborhoods and he was tired of seeing vacant houses. So he agreed to um, allow that to be used for anybody that said foreclosure, I'm behind my payments, they would automatically be transferred over to the, the, the counselors and to organizations like NHS. I saw one other hand go up, I think over here. Um, okay. Um, I could probably yell out. Uh, yeah. One partner that you picked up that really kind of caused it to go. Was it the city or were there others? Um, yeah, I think the city of Chicago was a, a big partner. I think the city of Chicago, Mayor Daly, and the, the local chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, in terms of bringing, helped us bring people together. And I think. Um, together with our executive director kind of really invited people, let's take a look at that. And we've, we've, we've had a strong, a long history with a lot of the banks in Chicago and um, they were very willing to take that first step with us. But it was controversial because I think you get, we have a lot of counselors that were like, we're gonna partner with so-and-so that all I see is you know 11% loans and 12% loans. So I think it was a hurdle to get over, but I think in the end, it's, yes, we screen for predatory lending. We screen for illegal loans. We just don't see them anymore. And so, you know, everybody's in the same boat of let's keep people in their homes. Cool, right on 20 minutes, like we talked about. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our, our next speaker, Mr. Bill Merrill, is with Freddie Mac. And Freddie Mac has been a critical partner and sponsor, certainly of the symposium. and over the years of a lot of activities, products, trends, volumes, etc., similar to what uh, Craig Nickerson was talking about at lunch. So without any further ado, I'm gonna ask um, Bill to talk about a very interesting initiative that Freddie Mac has undergone. Thank you. Everyone doing okay? Yeah. Post lunch, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna come out a little Oprah. <laughs> yeah. so I like keep people in there. So think of us as home ownership preservation, as loan modifications, as workouts, as foreclosure prevention. So just give you a little grounding of where we are. I'm gonna give you a little background on an initiative that we started last year, and it's still going very well today. 
We'll talk a little bit about the background and decisions we made. We'll talk a little bit about how we set it up, what some of our metrics were, some of the best practices that we've gotten out of the counseling program that we're doing, and maybe if I get a chance, some of the challenges that we have seen to date. So I'm really hoping to provide some information on the program that we have started. Both Craig and my boss, Ingrid, this morning talked a lot about the Roper survey that we did. And if you need to take a look at it, it's on our website, freddymac.com. It's one of the first studies that we could find about talking to actual delinquent borrowers. When we went out there, we said there is no survey on how delinquent borrowers really feel. We went out, engaged a third party, and surveyed them. We heard a lot of the results. I'll share a couple others that I found to be interesting was that 28% of the borrowers said there was no reason to talk to their lender. About 11% said they were, fear, they, they were fearful of the lender and that they were embarrassed to call. What I found to be really fascinating was that a majority of the borrowers said they had no idea what counseling was, but they thought it was a great idea and they would use it if they heard about it. So I seized on that and I took a look at two other metrics in our group and you see a lot of delinquency statistics out there. Two interesting metrics in our group, which uh, I will share today. The first is that when I look at our REOs, 6% of our REOs are failed loan modifications. So I took a look at that and I sort of look at it from a, a glass half full, is that there's an immense opportunity there to get workouts and to help 94% of my REOs. Those are people that went to foreclosure. That means that we're not talking to enough borrowers because as you heard this morning, we estimate about 50% go into foreclosure with no contact. That's a great opportunity, right? The other metric I wanna share is that early intervention is very important. Thir uh, repayment plans, I'm sure you're familiar with those that start at 30 days versus ones that start from 90 days on, the ratio of success is 56 versus 27. So easy math. We're twice as successful at curing borrowers when we start them at 30 days versus 90 plus. So when I seized an opportunity, these are some of the staff that took a look at and said, we need to do something about this. And let me talk a little bit about the setup. The first thing we did was go out and take a look for reputable nonprofit groups that could provide delinquency counseling nationwide. The list is pretty short, actually, the groups. So take a look at that. We need to increase delinquency counseling knowledge in the United States. So we found a group. Took a look at that. One of the best practices out of the setup was first, we contracted directly with the counseling group, okay? Us and CCCS have a direct contractual relationship. There's nobody in between us. We can resolve issues, we can train together. We can work through this and make it progressive by having a direct relationship. Another one is how we set up the reimbursement process. We set up a fixed administrative fee, the Freddie Mac case, the counseling groups, that help the setup process. And then the second part is what I like to call a variable fee, which is we pay based on success. So we have a fixed fee to help cost, hiring, computers, telephones, and then we incent the counseling group by saying, if you can cure borrowers, we're willing to pay additional for those types of counseling sessions and cures, and also work out referrals. That seems to be working very well. So one tip on that. Next we found, that outbound calls were tremendously more successful than mailings. Our initial mailing conversion rate was probably in the two to five percent rate. 100 mails, I could probably talk to two to five people. The outbound calls has lifted that to 25 percent. Okay, that is the counselor trying to contact the borrowers directly. What a fantastic improvement. We're going to continue that. Next, targeted specific geography. We obviously have a, uh, we look at our delinquency book, we take a look at where we have areas, the uh, middle of the country, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana. We want to target those areas, tend to see higher delinquency rates in those areas. Let's focus on those first out of the gate. Other benefit that we had was training. We have some good experience in workouts and delinquencies. So we went out and we trained counselors and we developed a training program and actually, we're bringing that to our entire Freddie Mac University of taking a look at how can we train counselors going forward. I'm ready to say that's really showing lots of progress. Metrics. We have four. And a lot of folks ask us, and I know a lot of folks have set up different types of metrics. Presentations to folks we're talking to. Our metric, 25%. I think that's fantastic. Next, contact to cure. Of the number of borrowers that we talked to, how many of those borrowers cured? When I say cured, I mean reinstated or had a workout. 
had a successful resolution. We're seeing about 47 to 48% of the bars we talk to cure. Okay, we've been running this for about a year. That's, we want to establish that as a benchmark. So approximately half. The next is workout referrals. How many workouts does the counselor refer to the service over to us? One of the interesting things we set up on the counselors was they can produce loan modifications and repayment plans. They can suggest those to the servicer. That was a new thing we were brought up. Okay, let me, hold on a second, I'll catch you at the end on that side. So that was a, a third metric. The fourth one is redefault rates. That's something that we use internal to Freddie Mac. It's if we do a workout, how many of those will refail? We'll go back into delinquency again. That shows me how successful the counseling was. Because if we're doing our job and we're doing financial counseling, we shouldn't see a lower redefault rate. What we saw was approximately uh, 50. So we're seeing a little bit better improvement, and I want to see that be a little better. That's our four metrics. <laughs> Best practices. Some of the things that we really have learned from this, I talked about early intervention before, we have to talk to the borrower as soon as possible. Our solicitation population is borrowers that are 45 days delinquent, 30 is too early, excuse me, 60 is too long, that's what we found, and that they have not talked to their servicer at that point in time. That's our bucket. We don't want to talk to them if they're already talking to their servicer, we assume that's what we Next, first contact is the most important conversation a counselor can have. It's the first time they talk to that borrower and introduce themselves. John talked a lot about that. Next, get to the root of the financial issue. What, might, what does that mean? It means I lost my job, that's one symptom, but maybe there's no cash reserves. We haven't done a good job of that financials. That's the root problem. We weren't prepared to lose our job. That, the counselor needs to mine for that information and have an open and honest conversation about income and expenses. That's key, that reduces our redefault rate because when we go into the modification, we're going into a reasonable budget and discussion on financials. The last one, that, and it's one we're really working on, is to continue to build the counselor and servicer relationship. That's been at odds in the past, we will all admit to that. Let's build that up, we're trying to facilitate that, Councils and servicers, conference calls, we have to share data and we have to share best practices going forward from there. That's my time. Beautiful. Part. Okay. Challenges real fast for us. Number one, we need to continue to build skill sets and build the number of delinquency counselors. It's a tough job. Okay, there's a lot of pre-origination counseling. I, we want to work and continue to build delinquency counseling skills. Next is really to build and lastly, build new ways to contact. Okay, we have mail, we have phone. How else can we reach borrowers? Because we still only have 25% contact rate. Okay, we think technology, websites, and other functions will be things that we'll take a look at, which may be borrowers more receptive to logging onto a website anonymously. Some servicers have done that and have seen very good success, including having borrowers come on that are still performing but know they're going to be delinquent. So, so those are some of our lessons learned and some of, of our challenges that we're facing. So let's stop there and see if there's any questions. You made a comment about working directly with the housing counselor yeah. and doing the workout, and the housing counselor do a preliminary workout. Any plans to integrate this into Council Max? Oh, any plans to integrate this into Council Max? We had some concerns about some of the workflows that it had and ability to track borrower financials and make recommendations on the borrower situation. I think the decision we're going to face is do we build out Council Max to do some of that analysis or do we see a, a second technology that maybe we already have that built in? And I think the key piece to that is we have to drive technology to the council shop so that that will help them with workflow, with that financial analysis, and help choose a workout. That doesn't exist in the needs to service attaches to it. Questions to the borrower, or the names of the borrowers to counselors. Now it sounds like you guys have gotten around that somehow or figured out a solution. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said you're having counselors yes. contact them. Correct, correct. Well, I don't know if it's gotten around. Okay. But uh, the absolutely what, what you're yeah. speaking of, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. The the what, what you're speaking of is Fair Debt Collection Act and Privacy Act. And the differences and advantages that we have as a GSC are inside the law. 
So a service or a lender, and I didn't hear this speak this morning, but I made the assumption, is a debt collector inside of the law. Okay, so that has a lot more privacy concern. We are a creditor as a GSC. So we're specifically carved out in the law as not being a debt collector. Okay. The, as long as we are partnering with a non a reputable, nonprofit, recognized group, we can engage in a contractual relationship as a service provider, because we also have attorneys that we do that with and other things. So the relationship is a, called a service provider, and that's how we do it, because we're a creditor, not a debt collector. Okay. That's an advantage we have over a service or a lender, but that makes sense. Yeah, what, what we actually do is we provide our investors with detailed delinquency information. We, uh, we are working with four groups. Mm -hmm. I have two national groups I mentioned, and I have two groups in Ohio, CCS of Columbus and Lutheran Services of Dayton, which is, has a good relationship in that city. So what we are studying right now is what is the business model? Because let's just, I'm uh, looking at conversion. All the metrics I talked about between somebody sitting in San Francisco doing an 800 number to anywhere in the US, that's a great business model because I can easily adjust to hotbed areas. They're not restricted. They can speak Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Chinese, right? And they can focus on one area. Gives me great scale. How does that model compare to I'm on the ground, I know the GM plant next to my house. I have a local economy, and I can do face-to-face -face counseling. We're studying both those models. Initial results, and when we say initial, is that the national one outperforms the local one. Okay, and that's in contact rate. I've got about, I, this is anecdotal, approximately half the folks that have face-to-face -face cancel. You probably see that as well. Um, that, does, that seems to, when we get them on the phone, on, on the phone, that transaction seems to be more fluid than a 50% cancellation rate on the in person. Now, what I have to measure longer is that the face-to-face -face counseling result in a pure borrower or less default rate than the national one. Haven't seen much differentiation on that side. So once we determine that, um, we'll, we'll uh, knowing that, I'm looking, thinking the national model, has, has good scale to She's the, and I don't mean a pun here, but she's probably the Don or Donna Quixote, in my opinion, of mortgage lending, because I've known her since Nation Education, or now post closed side. I remember 95 or 6, we're in Atlanta, Georgia, at an institute, and you were frustrated at a legacy organization that has since become Chase about why aren't they more. Sorry. Uh, in the homeownership preservation office, is that we are a central point of contact, port of entry, if you will, for nonprofit organizations that are working with Chase customer, mortgage customers that are delinquent on their payments. In this uh, little marketing brochure that you have about the homeownership preservation office, you'll see the toll free number. And what we have been doing for the past two years is publicizing and working with nonprofits to get this number out. So that if you are working with a Chase customer that's delinquent, we want you to call this number because we have people that um, are sensitive to working with counselors, that appreciate what you do, that understand the value added of having that third party working with our customers and counseling them and bringing them to the table so that we can help them and help them keep their home. So I encourage all of you to take this number home with you. There's a little magnet on the back so you can uh, Stick that up on your computer or somewhere and have our number close at hand in case you come across the Chase customer you help. Um, another key component of what we do, and hopefully some of you in this audience have participated in the training that we do, for closure prevention training through our office. Um, and it's basically educating you on less litigation workout options. Because one of the things we found through our toll free number, talking with counselors, but also being engaged in some of the local initiatives is not everybody understood what those workout solutions were and that they were product specific and that they were investor specific and that there were many complex um, issues to doing the workouts. And there was retention versus liquidation options. So we do about a four or five hour uh, training course, again, for nonprofit organizations that are doing the counseling. And we have worked with Naval Works in one of their modules on loss mitigation training, which hopefully, again, some of you will see uh, this week while you're during, doing the training uh, through InCheck this week. We implemented 
uh, the train in the first quarter of 05. So about 14, 15 months ago. Since that time, uh, we've delivered about 31 sessions and have about 900 counselors that have been trained in the last 15 months or so that have come through the chase at the local um, initiative level. Uh, when John was talking about the NHS uh, initiative, up in Chicago, we are the representatives for Chase there, again with the Port of Entry. Uh, we learn a lot from all the things he said, the critical pieces, the resources that need to be at the table, how important it is to have the communication, but also as a laboratory of these initiatives to see what some of the other uh, issues are that we need to be addressing. So we're, we also handle that for Chase. Uh, we're also working with the National Foreclosure Prevention Initiative with, through NeighborWorks of America, which we heard a little bit about today. But there are like 17 partners, and Deb certainly heard from her earlier today. Uh, National City is part of one of the partners there. Um, so we are working with them to get this picked off, to be a partner there, and uh, enhance the relationship and with the Ed Council. Uh, the other thing that uh, the Homeowners with Preservation Office really focuses on is we have an REO gifting discounted sale program. And I believe, John, we have probably gifted six properties one year and possibly two more this year yeah. in Chicago. Yeah, in, in your right. Um, and one of the, when we talk about the initiative in Chicago, one of the things they did is had a holistic program. They were looking at not just foreclosure prevention, but also uh, property retention and stabilizing the neighborhoods that have been hit by foreclosure. And they've been used as a model in many different markets, and we participate in about price seven or eight right now. But when it comes to um, you know the property, if a nonprofit can identify to us that there is a property that is really um, detrimental to the to the neighborhood, and we go through a whole formula of looking at that property and determining if that is a good candidate for us to be able to give to them, so that they can take that property, remodel it rehab it completely, and then put it back into a productive state in the neighborhood where it's no longer that um, eyesore, no longer that vacant property that is bringing in the homeless people or the crack houses and that type of thing, then we want to participate in that piece of um, So I encourage you uh, to also think about that if you have it in uh, retaining the properties and if you have the capabilities uh, to manage that kind of uh, project that maybe you can work with Chase on some of the properties that we have in our inventory. Um, one of the things I will tell you that we, a challenge has been is that many times we'll see Chase or National City or whoever the lender is as the um, lender of record on the foreclosure, and that doesn't always mean we own that REO. We may be the trustee, it may be a family property, it may be a credit property, it may be a HUD property. It's not necessarily coming back to Chase. So that has been one challenge, I think, in getting our REO property uh, program off the ground is uh, just understanding that every time you see a house, it may not be one that we can gift. And it does have to go through, you know, an assessment process for us to be able to gift it or sell it at a discount. Um, probably one of the most important lessons learned from a servicer standpoint, and again, we're the liaison to our servicing area, but two years ago when we opened this office, I think there was a very different attitude with services, certainly with Chase, and I think probably with a lot of the services around the country, is they truly did not understand the importance of the counseling piece to foreclosure prevention. Um, and I think that over the past two years, that has been something that we also saw the shift in dramatically at Chase, is that they do have a truer appreciation for what you do and for the added value of having that third party intermediary to come in and assist our customers it helps us because when you talk about national lenders, we're not talking about the customer just from a mortgage, we're that customer for life. So if we can be the lender that helps save their property, that helps them through a rough period in their life, and we have a good partner out in the community that um, promotes that as well, then we have probably saved that customer for life. Because if we're closing their house, the chances of them coming back to us for a car loan, for a bank account, for their student loan, is going to be slim to none because they're going to see Chase as the big bad lender that took their house and destroyed their family or marriage or whatever. So um, 
Well, I'd like to say it's all, you know, we, we do it because it's the right thing and it's, you know, important to us. All those things are true, but it also is a business um, step for us. If, if we can save that customer, we, we save that customer for a long time. So there is, we do recognize the value that the uh, pastors bring. So um, from a, uh, actually, um, the other lessons learned was the fact that communication is so critical to us in working with nonprofit organizations. And I think having um, our toll free line that you can call into it has really worked a long way in improving relationships with the counselors. Um, I'm anxious to hear any feedback from you if, if um, you've had a different experience than that. But in working with CCRC and certainly with NHS in Chicago and some of the other initiatives, I think they have found it um, very beneficial for to have a port of entry, and I think other services are starting to create that as well. So we're happy to see that because I think it will make a difference in the national program as well as the local initiatives that we're involved in. So I would be happy to take any questions you have. Oh, well, I did attend your training, of course. And one of the things that I thought that was remarkable that you had a program that you can also assist consumers who have not yet delinquent. So could you kind of expound on that? You talked about that a little bit in your training. In the product, there are special forbearance. And we, we do uh, encourage early uh, intervention because if we can get someone who is going to be laid off and they know they're going to be laid off, they're going to be off for the summer. Um, there are times when we can put them on special forbearance with the understanding that they have a job to go back to, you know, or that there's a solution at the end, we can then put them on a repayment plan. Now, a lot of people would go ahead and get delinquent two, three, four months, boy, uh, and if we can get that message out more for again, early contact, we can work with it better. If we know up front what the situation's gonna be, or as early in the delinquency as possible. So I think that's what you were talking about, and, and sometimes it's product specific. Yes. Any other questions? Well, is how many cases we open and how many saves that we're seeing through the health line. Because our, our position is, is that without the health line, without the customers that the nonprofits are coming in, bringing into our health line, that we probably would not be hearing from those people who quite not love in the town. So. I've got one other question that may not pertain directly to your program. There's a lot of folks in here who are agency that want to talk to a local or maybe a regional bank which has a lot of clients coming in for foreclosure counseling. What are a couple of key talking points you think that folks from an agency level should bring to the table when they approach maybe that institution for help underwriting the cost of them helping their clients? Um, you know, it, it really, if you're going to approach it, I always say approach it from a business standpoint because there are, we all have the philanthropic areas, we have the foundations, and there's certainly, that's an area if you just want to flat out a grant. Um, many of us are fo focusing on financial literacy and that type of thing now for those foundations. But you need to approach it from the servicing area, from a standpoint of the business. Bottom line, how much you're going to be able to save them. And don't always use the forty dollars or $50,000, because you may be saving somebody forty or $50,000, it's not usually us. We are going to, um, receive back from Fannie, Freddie, or HUD, depending on the property. If it goes back to them or to the MI companies, um, you know, they're going to cover most of our losses. We're probably going to see maybe three, four, five thousand 5000 unless it's bank home. So the first thing you do if you come in and say, we can save you forty or 50000 you're going to lose them because we're not losing forty or 50000 The industry in general is. So we're going to approach it that way. But talk about uh, what you can do customer long-term customer for a national or a regional bank, I think is an important uh, conversation to have. Again, we want them forever, and we want them for all the different things that we sell, not just the mortgage. So, uh, you know, from that standpoint, from the line of business approach, um, you need to have numbers. You need to understand what your cost is and be able to have the budget to show what you're really asking us to support and to understand that uh, because it, it's, it's going to be a business decision at the end of the day, unless you go to the philanthropic, and then that's a different approach. Thank you. And, you know, Deb, I open it up for you if you have anything here to say. Because we're both, I think, it should be a business decision. I think we look at you know, my folks as traveling buddies these days. <laughs> we find ourselves a lot of times together. Um, 
I think your answer is is very correct. Um, the fact is that when you approach the servicer of a local bank, you're going to find that the bulk of the loans they're managing are for Freddie, Fannie, they're getting their loans. So the actual loss that the servicer takes is just a very, very small piece of the overall property loss that is realized. We don't get reimbursed totally by HUD for all the things we have to do to protect the HUD loan. That's a fact. Um, that varies from $1,500 to $3,500 alone. So you can see while HUD may be losing, same for Freddie and Fannie. We debate those numbers all the time in the Freddie Mac meetings. Depending on who you talk to, their losses may vary. We can save you $50,000 if you do this, this, and this. Or get, trust us, give us the money, we'll add to our capacity. Well, that's not going to work. Servicers work off business. Well, the base compensation is some form of incentive. Just how does that work? And you don't have to be so specific. But just so somebody knows, don't bother to go down there unless you can get 10,000 loans to work on because this is what the compensation is like. I, I will take a slightly different approach to the answer. You know, I already know what my credit losses are per loan. I already know where they are by state, by county, by servicer. I, I would say um, that if you came to me, I don't need to be convinced. To Things that I would look for are what are the skill sets of my staff? How experienced are they? Do I do seminars in the community that build value and train borrowers? Do I have a long history of doing delinquency counseling? Because that's not a skill set that's all over the place, right? There's a lot of origination counseling, but I have a core group of delinquency counselors that have been with my team for a while. We can attract talent. We can handle nationwide scalability, the question you asked earlier, because remember, I'm looking at 200 to 300,000 delinquent loans in the United States, Guam, Puerto Rico. Occupying in one state only has a limited value to the scale. To cover that provides a lot of benefit. The ability to cover multiple time zones, to be multilingual. Uh, one of the new things we're looking at with the groups we're working at today is technology. Do you have a website that educates borrowers? Do you have a website that allows borrowers to come in and interact with your website, such as call me back at three o'clock, this is what a loan modification is. Those types of things as entry points for folks that don't want to pick up the phone from there. Is your staff trained on workouts? Do they understand multiple investors? Do they have good communication with servicers? Do you have a strong nonprofit reputation? I'm going to use off the top of my head. As a reputable nonprofit, right? The IRS is looking at a lot of that now. As a GSC in our political situation, I have to work with very reliable, reputable groups. Their daddy can help them it does sound like the barriers to entry into this are pretty sizable, and that's why there might be a limited number of players. I mean, in the industry? Yeah, yeah, I think it's also a unique skill set. And it's a difficult one. I, I think the groups that we have, they see turnover. It's tough talking to borrowers all day about, because each one has a different issue. I lost my job. And the from, that can be stressful. Retaining that staff and training them, giving them off, off hours, times to unwind continue to build their skill sets is important. Those are things I look for. Can you a job or increase medical, the family has got a way to cope with it. It seems like we're only concentrating on one part of the spectrum when really what we should be doing is looking at all counseling across the board so that we prevent it in the long run. There just seems to be, and, and yet there seems to be a lack of emphasis and emphasis consistently going downward on home buyer education, and I, for one, I know my peers are very concerned about that. That's all. Um, I think with the with the pre-purchase classes, we now have, now have eight hours with the pre-purchase classes, so four two-hour classes, and the very last class, we we save about you know the last forty-five minutes for post-purchase warnings in terms of prepare to be unemployed. The whole idea of the rainy day fund. I mean, it's the worst advice in the world that our grand. I mean, you know, our grandparents gave. Nobody follows this, but the whole idea of that, you know, that fund, you know, six months mortgage payments. Does anybody do that anymore? But really, kind of throwing things like that out there. The whole idea of you know a pen and a gun. You know, you could be robbed with with either or, and that you know 
be very careful what you sign. So everything we do has that message. And I think in terms of reaching out to lenders, it's been hard in terms of making the business case for every time we have a foreclosure sake, you should, you know, it's worth this much. It's It's been difficult to do. We could say, okay, we've documented 300 foreclosure saves in the last two years and we've got all kinds of data on them. But in the end, any one servicer, it's like 10, 15, 20. So it does, it's hard. There's been more success in terms of outreach. Um, we have a program with, uh, it's Chase, Chase HSBC and Homecomings where, like I said, they mail out invitations to, to people that are in foreclosure to an NHS seminar. And we actually pay, you know, have little gifts and incentives for them to come. So in terms of getting people in the door that might not have, we've had a little more success showing, you know, things there. But the business case for, you know, we did this foreclosure save, but for NHS of Chicago, this person would have lost their home, and they could say, yeah, but uh, you partnered with our loss mitigation. You know, maybe our loss mitigation could have done their own. So it's a difficult case to make, but I think the getting people into the door through your your reputations of your organizations that you know when they might not have. Uh, contact the bank is another way to do it. Thank you. No problem. And you know, that's a, again, it's a very important point because, you know, I've been in this business probably longer than Donna, which is why she looks younger than me. She's buying tonight too, I believe. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is, trends is what this industry often flows around. Oh, you have been in longer. Trends is what this, what this business flows around. And so we're seeing high profile discussion of mortgage foreclosure, but I personally haven't seen um, a decrease in the value system that is brought about home buyer education, financial fitness, etc. cetera. So um, I, I think we need to make sure we don't diminish the role of every aspect of that communication. Um, Donna, could you talk from uh, the institutional lender perspective? And again, I'm not going to necessarily put you on the spot for Chase, but I'd like you to talk about from a, a lender's perspective on these priorities of where is education going? I don't think um, we're losing sight of the overall need for the financial literacy, the pre-purchase counseling, and the home buyer education. Um, I'd be very saddened if I thought that was taking place because I think that's the only thing that's going to help long term. And I think we have to all keep in mind, and I think the lenders do. I know Chase is still very much a funder of financial literacy and home buyer education. However, I think that um, right now, this is the hot button for closure prevention right now. And it's almost, I don't want to say it's a crisis mode, but it is something that we have to respond to right now. So we have to focus on getting people up to capacity, getting, you know, what is the best way of delivering foreclosure prevention training and education and the awareness that needs to take place out in the local where the foreclosures are happening. So I think we're putting a lot of energies towards that right now. I think part of it is also is um, you are looking at different areas within the lending institutions that handle financial literacy is one place, loss mitigation, foreclosure prevention is our servicing and the servicers are new to the game. I mean, it's just that simple. They aren't used to dealing with the nonprofit and the education. You got your loan, you search your loan, and you pay. <laughs> you know, so. Thank you, Donna. And Bill, real quick. Sure. And even though Donna's not institutionally on the spot, dude. No. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say I agree with your point. I, I can, my feeling is we can never do it without counsel. Right, whether it's pre-origination or with you. Thank you.